So I, I have to admit that I am also uh, taking all of this in and feeling uh, like a perpe perpetual imposter uh, at this, on this stage. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. If we could just go to the, the first slide of my presentation. This is the last slide. We could just go right back to the beginning. What I'll start off by telling you is when I give talks on implicit bias, over time, I ask the audience, how many of you have heard about the concept of implicit bias? And I don't even have to do that anymore. Because implicit bias is simply everywhere. Whether related to Starbucks' decision to close 8,000 stores on May 29th for bias training, or on the presidential debate stage, an international conversation on implicit bias has entered our mainstream dialogue. While we're all familiar with the concept of explicit biases, which include attitudes and behaviors regarding certain groups with the intent to harm or exclude, these explicit biases can be obvious, like racism, or believing that one race is superior to another, but they can also be subtle, like favoring someone we know or someone who looks and acts like us. These explicit biases are conscious, intentional, and deliberate. We can move to the next slide. In contrast, implicit biases are stereotypes that form through our experiences and work outside of our awareness. Even though we're not aware of them, implicit biases lead to discriminatory behaviors and biased decisions. Implicit biases can also include nonverbal behaviors, cues, or avoidance. These implicit biases are often manifested through microaggressions. By their very nature, implicit biases influence us automatically, without our knowledge, and despite our best intentions. Altogether, these explicit, implicit, and structural biases perpetuate inequities, and I would offer erode our collective well-being. So today's conversation is about diversity, inclusion, and wellness. As you're hearing today, we know that implicit biases have a vastly disproportionate influence on certain populations. If you are a woman, a cultural minority, LGBT, or a racial or invisible minority, implicit biases can undermine your self-belief, your achievement, and your well-being. Minority and underrepresented clinicians live in the thick cloud of stereotype threat, which Steele and Arison found leads to anxiety and negative feelings that consistently undermine one's confidence and ability to succeed. So as you can see from the slide, whether you rise to prominence as a Supreme Court justice or are consistently referred to as miss instead of doctor, Daily experiences of prejudice and discrimination reduce one's sense of belonging and connection. We begin to view ourselves as perpetual imposters who do not deserve the recognition or success that we accomplish. So what happens when one of us is struggling? Well, we build wellness programs and we promote access to support services. But do our clinicians access those services? The answer is a resounding no. We know that simply offering help is not enough. Consistently, research identifies that stigma, the negative attitudes and behaviors towards individuals suffering from mental illness or addictions, is one of the most prominent barriers to help seeking, particularly among minority and underrepresented clinicians. We live and breathe in a culture where stoicism is rewarded and self-care is perceived as selfish. Our students and residents are learning to become clinicians in a learning environment where patients with mental illness are not welcomed with open arms. Instead of unconditional empathy, such patients are all too often greeted with indifference, shame, and blame. As author and researcher Brene Brown says, Shame corrodes the very part of us that believes that we are capable of change. While system leaders often share stories of physical illness to inspire improvements in our clinical practices, I ask of you, 
Would a hospital CEO or medical school dean be as open about their struggles with mental illness or addictions? Until the answer is an emphatic yes, we have a lot of work to do. Research on stigma has taught us that over time, our awareness of these associations progresses to agreement. We begin to agree that mental illness is associated with weakness, and we apply this to ourselves if we are struggling. Eventually, the self-stigma gets internalized, leading to learned helplessness, and in the most tragic circumstances, self-stigma is associated with suicide. In this context, I recently asked at a spring meeting of the AAMC on Twitter, well, why do we talk about wellness without having uncomfortable conversations about mental health? Dr. McNamara, who provided permission for me to use this, replied and highlighted powerful forces, including stigma, shame, regulatory challenges, avoidance of discomfort, and malignant perfectionism. Now, as I began my career, I knew that stigma was not a new concept. It's been researched extensively. We've had many public stigma reduction campaigns, so why aren't we moving the needle forward? Eventually, I drew connections between what we know about implicit social cognition and my daily life. As a stigma researcher and practicing child and adolescent psychiatrist, I became a junior faculty member and experienced my own struggles. Survival for me meant disconnecting myself from what it meant to be human. It seemed like the only way to honor my physician's oath was to be less than human. The tacit messages I received from my training were similar. Numb yourself, harden yourself, and protect yourself from feeling anything too deeply. Like many of us, I did not follow the same advice that I give to my patients. Instead of demonstrating self-compassion, I felt victim to the virus of self-blame. I worked harder and harder, running faster and faster, like a hamster on a wheel. It took introspection and support to realize I was not alone. It slowly became evident to me that our existing approaches to reducing stigma have been focused on dividing us instead of recognizing our shared humanity. If we think of reducing stigma by emphasizing that there somehow is a bad group of us who stigmatize mental illness and a good group of us who does not, we will find ourselves in a constant cycle of distancing and disconnection. Whether we focus on reducing stigma or reducing the adverse impact of implicit bias, we must start by looking in the mirror at ourselves. The conversation can only begin once we humble ourselves by recognizing that we are all deeply flawed and imperfect human beings. So I therefore focused my program of, of research on a marriage between implicit bias and stigma. What me and my team found that by focusing on the implicit aspects of stigma, we emphasize that we all exhibit stigma despite our best intentions. We found that our approach to stigma education instantly normalizes the experience of demonstrating stigma as we move towards bro fostering broader social and cultural change through implicit bias awareness. Our research has helped inform a model of implicit bias recognition and management that starts with seeking feedback. Once we become aware of our own biases, we must reflect on how these biases impact ourselves and others, then we set practical goals to change our explicit behaviors. In our work, we found that implicit bias recognition cannot be accomplished alone. We must seek dialogue to reconcile our biases, and our peers actually can help motivate us to change our behaviors. Interventions to reduce the adverse impact of bias are most effective when people who work together learn together, and when interprofessional teams feel comfortable and safe being open about their biases with one another. A serendipitous finding of our work relates back to the malignant perfectionism I referred to earlier. As we provided clinicians with feedback about their implicit biases, they struggled to reconcile this information and experienced a significant amount of distress. While we know from existing research on feedback that we all struggle to reconcile feedback that's inconsistent from self-perceptions, our research found that when physicians and nurses were provided with feedback about their implicit biases, this information was inconsistent with an idealized version of themselves 
that was free of bias and simply impossible to achieve. Our participants felt that they were not allowed to have bias while recognizing that bias is inherently human. They also felt that their identities were compartmentalized and they told us about the many, many masks that they wear while taking care of others. They described the disconnection that they feel from their true selves and the moral distress they experienced when they tried to accept their biases. As we explored this further, we found that reconciling biases requires balancing for an ideal while accepting one's shortcomings. We also learned that faculty felt that they were serving as role models while residents described struggling to find role models who were courageous to open up about their own struggles. Despite these challenges, we've found that inviting dialogue within clinical learning environments and promoting critical questioning of workplace restraints can make a difference. In our most recently published paper, we followed participants longitudinally for 12 months after implicit bias training. And we learned that once we trigger awareness, these participants began reflecting on their biases and engaging in explicit behavioral changes that actually influenced their perception of change that was structural within the learning environment itself. Together, our participants described co-constructing social change. Now, ultimately, addressing implicit bias and stigma is something that doesn't just require our awareness. It also requires our sustained motivation and action. There are things we must do to make this change possible. It also cannot be accomplished at the individual level. We need explicit structural and organizational reform to make this happen. If we encourage our learners and our faculty to demonstrate and role model the courage to be vulnerable, and then we punish them for their disclosure through regulatory retribution or harassment in the workplace, then we're actually creating more problems than we're solving. Emerging research, therefore, provides us with a framework to address both implicit bias and stigma within our organizations. We need courage. Courage to speak up about our own struggles. Courage to challenge stereotypes and become role models for others who may be suffering in silence. We also need courage to question and challenge our toxic culture of perfection. We also need to demonstrate compassion. Compassion for our patients suffering with mental illness and addictions. Otherwise, this hidden curriculum within the clinical learning environment will continue to feed stigma and continue to erode wellness. I hope you will join me and leave today with a commitment to change. Be the role models our students and residents need. Be the leaders who demand structural and regulatory reforms. Be the difference we seek to achieve. Thank you.